it's not, not very many museum or gallery directors of my acquaintance cite Deleuze, which I think shows that the Bard Graduate Center is a rather special place. <laughs> Megan Bill is our next speaker. Megan Bill is curatorial ass assistant for the arts of Asia, Africa, the Pacific Islands, and the Islamic world, so yeah. most of the world, <laughs> uh, at the Brooklyn Museum. She has an MA in Museum Anthropology from Columbia University, and her particular interest is the intersection of museum anthropology and decolonizing methodologies. She's specifically concerned with the ways American museums can utilize their collections of Pacifica materials to collaborate with and support Pacifica community projects. Her current research investigates the history of the Brooklyn Museum's Pacific collections, which includes over 300 Indonesian textiles, two of which are featured in the exhibition. She becomes, as becomes someone who works on the Pacific, Megan is an avid sailor, uh, <laughs> something we need to talk about. She has also been collaborating with me this semester, hosting three visits of my seminar on the arts and material culture of Oceania in the storage study rooms at the Brooklyn Museum. Just an amazing opportunity for our students to work with actual things. So her talk this afternoon is a history of Indonesian textiles at the Brooklyn Museum. Please welcome Megan Bill. Um, hello, thank you all for coming out to this symposium. It's truly an honor to be on such an esteemed panel in the limelight of a fantastic exhibition. And thank you to the entire BARD team for putting this symposium together. It's, it's um, exhilarating and quite exciting. Um, like Ivan, I would also like to acknowledge that it is on Lenny Lenape land that we are gathered here today, and that the collections I will be discussing are housed within an institution on Canarsie land. And given that the scope of the discussions that we will be engaging with today are talking about power and agency, I feel it especially important to name our settler colonial reality here in Manhattan, New York. Um, and I would also, also like to acknowledge that I am coming to this table with a different background than most of the folks here. Uh, I don't have an extensive knowledge of Indonesian history, its peoples, or its arts. Rather, I'm here as a museum practitioner who is interested in developing ways to engage meaningfully with museum collections, in this case, the Brooklyn Museum collection of Indonesian textiles. So I hope that by delving into its history and by connecting that history to current projects, that um, we, we at the museum can develop meaningful ways to, of um, reinterpreting and engaging with this collection going forward. So that is why I am here today, and I would be remiss if I didn't thank Ramilla for both inviting me to this panel, but also for sending me an email two years ago that um, kind of sparked this whole project. She opened my eyes to the richness of the museum's collection, and I am indebted to her for sparking what I hope is the start of many future projects. So as I said, on that day in April 2016, I received an email from Ramilla about a textile in the museum's collection. She had discovered it in a book by Madabel Gittinger, and its description is here on the screen. Um, it alludes to bold colors and vibrant red motifs beneath a vexingly unhelpful black and white image. <laughs> so, <laughs> Armilla asked what I knew about this textile and if we could get some color photography to see if it might work for her upcoming exhibition. And at the museum, we had no color image on file. There was no object file for this particular textile. There was no file on the donor, Van Kirkhoff. Um, <laughs> Except our, our database only said that it was um, a Salendon from Bali, likely acquired in the early 20th century. So I asked Ramilla for some time to delve into our archives, and I set to work. So my talk today will examine the myriad forces and actors that brought this textile from Bali into a museum in Brooklyn 10,000 miles away. As the symposium is as, at its heart about weaving, I will attempt to weave a story of my engagement with one Salendong into the larger tapestry of its embedded colonial and institutional histories. But to understand this textile story, it is first necessary to understand the history of the museum it now calls home. So what today we call the Brooklyn Museum was founded in 1823 as the Brooklyn Apprentices Library, a space meant to educate and train young tradesmen of the burgeoning city of Brooklyn. By 1890, the organization had expanded drastically and embarked on an ambitious plan to build the largest museum complex in the world. 
the Brooklyn Institute of Arts and Sciences, as it was imagined, would have been roughly four times the size of the current institution and would house not only fine arts, ethnology, and natural history collections, but would also have, have incorporated what would later become the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens, the Brooklyn Academy of Music, and the Brooklyn Children's Museum. This expansion was rooted in a desire to share, in the words of the Institute's first director, quote, all known human history, the infinite capacity, <laughs> tall order, right? Um, the infinite capacity of man to act and to think and to love and the many departments of science and of art which he has developed. Through its collections in the arts and sciences and through its libraries, it should be possible to read the history of the world, end quote. But a wrench of sorts in these plans arrived in 1898 when already four years into the construction of this monumental building, the city of Brooklyn was formally incorporated into the greater city of New York. So now it was sharing a cultural space with the major Manhattan institutions like the American Museum of Natural History and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The uh, newly minted Brooklyn Institute had to wrestle with a crisis of identity, namely how to distinguish Brooklyn as a destination that could offer something different than the institutional behemoths across the river. So, enter Stuart Keulin. In 1903, Keulin was appointed curator of the museum's newly established Department of Ethnology, the other two departments being Natural Sciences and Fine Arts. The museum administrators wished to, to amass a large ethnological collection, and although Keulin personally disdained making a distinction between ethnological and fine arts collections, he did acknowledge that the, the division was practical for an institution with such lofty collecting ambitions. Kulin had already fostered an interest in the games and material culture of China, Korea, and the indigenous peoples of the American Southwest, Pacific Northwest, and California, but he quickly set about to growing the museum's collection of African, Asian, and Eastern European art as well. Ultimately, he believed that a museum should be established, quote, not as a place of antiquities and relics, but as preserving the seed of things which may blossom and fruit again, end quote. So the Dutch East Indies, as it was known at the time, was never really a collecting priority of Kulin, but nevertheless a few notable Indonesian objects were acquired early on. Javanese shadow puppets and painted textiles were some of the early wor earliest works that would later become the Arts of the Pacific Islands collection. These acquisitions were few and far between, and as I said, rarely an institutional priority, but on the occasion that Kulin did purchase Indonesian material, he put his keen eye toward the acquisition of some truly beautiful textiles including this silk saput from Bali. Kulin is perhaps best known for being one of the first curators to think of a museum installation as an art form unto itself. His groundbreaking 1923 exhibition of African primitive, or excuse me, primitive Negro art was one of the first to display African objects as art objects rather than ethnological specimens. And his 1925 Rainbow House installation in the museum's Great Hall was a fascinating experiment in the use of color to demarcate regional collections. But Kulin is also known for his work with American textile manufacturers who visited study rooms full of museum objects to seek inspiration for new designs. The museum's collaboration with Women's Wear Daily and a number of designers uh, in the early 20th century are quite well documented, but I find it interesting that the early collection of Indonesian textiles does not seem to have featured prominently in these partnerships. The images and descriptions of, stu of the study rooms feature African, uh, African art, as you can see here, as well as Indian, Peruvian, and East Asian textiles, but nothing, as far as I can tell, was from Indonesia. Uh, and moreover, exhibitions of Indonesian material were few and short-lived during Kulin's tenure. Between 1926 and 1928, there were two exhibitions th that featured private collections of textiles from up throughout the Indonesian archipelago, but each of these exhibitions remained on view for roughly a month, and unfortunately, Nothing has yet been found in our archives to suggest what they may have looked like or how they may have been received. So the story of the Indonesian textile collection really begins in earnest with the appointment of Tisilo Adam. This is as yet the only photo I've been able to find of Adam. Um, he was a German photographer and filmmaker turned amateur ethnologist, and he spent much of his young adulthood working on and then later managing tobacco plantations on Sumatra. However, his passions lay in photography, film, and collecting. Adam spent over a, decading, over a decade photographing and filming Batak communities in Sumatra. An example of photography of Koro Batak is here. Um, and then in 1921, Adam moved to Java, where he photographed, filmed, and documented the, uh, the activities 
of Joe Jacquard's court life. Most of his object collections now reside in the Tropen Museum in Amsterdam, but his photographs and films can also be found in collections in the Smithsonian, the New York Public Library, and the Library of Congress. So Adam joined the Brooklyn Museum in May of 1929 as interim curator of ethnology following the death of Stuart Keelan. Herbert Spinden soon after took over as head of the ethnology department, but Adam stayed on as curator for oriental art. Adam viewed the role of ethnology in museums primarily as a means of educating Americans, particularly children, on the diversity of peoples of the world. Still reeling from the violence of World War I, he believed that ethnological exhibitions could prevent undue arrogance among young Westerners and foster greater compassion for peoples of the world. In a letter to the director of the Brooklyn Institute shortly after being hired, Adam wrote, quote, our younger generations have to be assisted <laughs> and instructed in the understanding of foreign peoples. A museum of ethnology can be of immense service to our younger people, but much depends on the system of method by which it has been accordingly built up. So like his predecessor, Keelan, Adam wanted to resist the easy dichotomy between ethnographic and fine arts collections. And his exhibition projects demonstrate his attempts to merge the two by focusing on material processes, artistic techniques, and their social meanings, as well as providing elegant settings in which to appreciate their aesthetic beauty. Nevertheless, Adam was concerned with the typical museum, of, museum dilemma of the day, which was how to amass a complete and representative collection of Indonesian material. So one way to do this, he insisted, was with an exhibition. Um, in some senses, Adam was the perfect choice to spearhead an exhibition on Dutch East Indian art. He owned an extensive textile collection himself, which he later sold to the Brooklyn Museum. He was familiar with the area, as well as the other uh, collections of Indonesian material in Europe. So the exhibition opened in April 1930 and focused primarily on textiles, architecture, and shadow puppet theater. Gaps in the museum's collection were supplemented by loans from Dutch colonial museums and private collectors. Adam's organizing framework, as evidenced by the archives, demonstrated a deep wish to make American museum goers more familiar with the arts and cultures of Indonesia. Ultimately, he wanted, quote, to make the beautiful and highly interesting islands of the Dutch East Indies, which are almost unknown in America, more known, end quote. So this here is the only installation image of the exhibition that I've been able to find so far. Um, it primarily is showcasing uh, puppets. At the center of the display, you can see some photographs of Javanese performers, which were possibly taken by Adam and then row upon row of puppets surround these photographs, and a garland of some sort is just visible at the top of the image. Unfortunately, no label copy has been found to better understand how Adam wished to interpret these materials for his visitors. However, we do get a more nuanced sense of Adam's project through the uh, complementary activities that were surrounding this ex exhibition. So during the run of the exhibition, um, there were at least two dance performances one by the esteemed Ruth St. Dennis and another by Vera Morova, both Americans. Uh, Ruth St. Dennis was known for her Orientalist, Orientalist performances, which drew on Hindu, ancient Egyptian, and East Asian aesthetics to create a new form of modern dance. Shortly after the opening of the Brooklyn Museum, she performed in the museum's sculpture court along with four of her students. Now, it's, it's unclear exactly who is pictured in this photograph, but this image does offer insight into the costumes and presentation of the white American women who perform supposedly authentic Javanese dances. Um, but I think it should be noted that these performances were not simply a supplemental form of entertainment to draw in visitors to the exhibition. Uh, rather, Adam saw the performances as opportunities to showcase the creative potential for understanding Javanese theater for American artists. Uh, Adam included photographs like this one in his exhibition to illustrate the interest of American dancers in Javanese performance. And to get a sense of what these performances were like, this is a, a flyer from uh, Madame Vera Morova's performance. And uh, if you take a look, some of the dance names were an impression of the Orient, a Hindu dance, a princess dance, and a dance of the Isle of Bali. Mm -hmm. And also note at the very base there, the assertion that uh, the music and costumes are absolutely authentic. <laughs> um, so like Kulin before him, Adam was desiring not only to educate American visitors on the richness of Indonesian arts, but he also sought to use museum collections as sources of inspiration for contemporary artists and performers. 
So I'd like to return for a minute to our mystery Selendong. Um, in my effort to learn more about it, I spent some time examining the textile in storage. It is part of a larger collection of 148 textiles loaned to the museum in 1930, most of which have tags attributing them to a Mr. A.J.C. Van Kirkhoff and The Hague. And it's a blurry photo, I apologize, but at the top it says collection, A.J.C. Van Kirkhoff, The Hague, Holland, number 148, which was the local collection number, origin, Isle of Bali, description, Slendong, Ecot, and then the Brooklyn Museum succession number. Most of the textiles also include these um, lead tags that are stamped with what looks like the Royal Coat of Arms of the Netherlands. Um, so a bit more archival digging uncovered the fact that this collection was brought to Brooklyn specifically to be exhibited in Adam's show of Dutch East Indian art. Adam claimed that Van Kirchhoff's collection was, quote, the finest collection of textiles of the entire archipelago, which is quite a statement from a man who frequently lauded the merits of his own collection of Indonesian batiks. Um, unfortunately, my inability to read Dutch has su thus far inhibited me from truly understanding the history of this particular collection. Um, here are two more examples of textiles from the Kirchhoff collection. It is clear that he acquired the material sometime between 1906 and 1913, a period emblematic of what he considered to be untouched textile traditions doomed to, doomed to suffer in quality with the influx of tourists bringing foreign demands for textiles later on. Um, and Van Kirchhoff seems to have been employed in some way by the Dutch colonial government, and his collecting activities seem driven by both aesthetic and ethnological interests. But there is obviously a lot more work to be done in piecing <coughs> together this history. Um, so a number of Van Kirchhoff's textiles were later additions to Adam's exhibition, including this Balinese Selendong. This is one of the few of which we have exhibition photography from 1930, and this is an image of the textile today. Um, most of the Van Kirchhoff collection was eventually <coughs> purchased by the museum in 1945, and the rest of the collection that isn't at Brooklyn now resides at the MFA in Boston. Uh, this here is another example from the Van Kirchhoff collection, which is on view in the Bard Galleries now. So despite overseeing a number of important reinstallations of Asian art, Tassilo Adams' tenure came under strain over the years. From correspondence, it appears that his relationship to Her Herbert Spinden, who was the head curator of ethnology, was quite tense. Um, and Adam also had difficulty accepting that the institution often spent more on fine arts exhibitions and loans than on ethnological ones. Um, and Adam's time at the museum was also marked by unforeseen hardship. Having lost most of his inheritance in the turbulence of World War I, Adam relied on the small salary from the Brooklyn Museum to support himself and his family. And then five months into his appointment, the stock market crash of 1929 rocked New York. Mm -hmm. Adam's salary was significantly reduced and it also negated the possibility of the raise that he was promised upon his appointment. Moreover, his son was suffering from tuberculosis and required extensive medical care, and Adam really wished to send his daughter to school abroad where she could better pursue dance. In increasing desperation, Adam offered to sell the remainder of his personal collection, including his most prized batiks collected by himself and his wife, Johanna. But it appears that the museum did not purchase much from Adam, citing depletion of funds and lack of interest in the remaining collection. All these tensions came to a head in 1934 when Adam finally resigned. So I think Tassilo Adam's strongest legacy at the museum rests with the massive collection of Indonesian material he acquired during his brief tenure at the museum. Under his supervision, the museum acquired over 200 textiles from Java, Bali, Sumatra, Sumba, Sumbawa, Sulawesi, Timor, Borneo, and other islands. Um, but these acquisitions do not seem to have made an impact on later exhibition projects at the museum. The only definitive use to which Adam's collection was put after his departure is a group of small wax figures, formerly owned by Adam, which were exhibited in the museum's first comprehensive exhibition of oceanic art in 1942. These figures reportedly were made in 1820, and they demonstrate a market scene and a wedding procession, and were meant to indicate the ethnic diversity of 19th century Java, particularly through depictions of clothing. So here are some examples of these figures. Um, they were displayed in the Oceanic Art Exhibition to accurately depict the life of the islands, the different types of people there, and especially the colors of their costumes. Ironically, it does not appear that any actual textiles supplemented this narrative. <laughs> so um, indeed, the Indonesian textile collection languished in relative obscurity after Adam's departure. There was an exhibition in 1936 of Balinese textiles organized by Colin McPhee, 
Um, unfortunately, little has been found in our archives to supplement in, in any kind of understanding of what that exhibition looked like. Um, and over the intervening decades, a few exhibitions did include textiles in their checklists, most notably an exhibition of Indonesian art in 1959, but nothing has approached the scope or magnitude of Adam's 1930 exhibition. So after completing this research on Adam Van Kirkhoff, the museum's exhibition history, I started to wonder what contributed to the disuse of the Indonesian textile collection at Brooklyn. Adam was arguably the staunchest supporter of the collection in the museum's history, but many of his colleagues praised the collection as being both visually stunning and representative of immense artistic skill. Why then, I wondered, did so little come of this vast collection? Part of the answer, I believe, lies in the institutional, in institution's gradual denigration of non-Western textiles. Over the nearly 90 years between 1930 and today, a number of textile exhibitions have been assembled at the Brooklyn Museum, but very few have ever featured non-Western textiles. And part of the answer lies also, I think, in the way in which objects were sorted into different collections. In general, if an object was very old or associated with any of the major religions of Asia, such as Hinduism or Buddhism, it fell to the Oriental Art Department and eventually the Arts of Asia. However, if the object was determined to be ethnographic or of a folk art tradition, it went to the Primitive Art Department. This department would later be divided into the Arts of Africa, Arts of the Pacific Islands, and Arts of the Americas. I think part of the answer, too, lies in the marginal nature of Indonesia in Western cartographic and ethnographic means of classification. Although physically considered part of Asia, the arts of Indonesia are rightly considered and examined as subjects of study separate from the traditions of the rest of the continent. At the Brooklyn Museum, Indonesian material is almost always part of the primitive art department, and today it's now part of the Pacific Islands collection. Yet the association of Indonesia with the Pacific makes as little sense as it does with mainland Asia. So Indonesia kind of provides a, a problem of categorization. It's understood to be neither suitably Asian nor Pacific. And because the Indonesian textile collection was determined early on to be ethnographic, it has remained with the Arts of the Pacific Islands collection up till today. So the textile's uh, affiliation with the Arts of the Pacific Islands also explains part of this collection's neglect. The Arts of the Pacific region have intermittently been a priority at the Brooklyn Museum, but curators in charge of the collection have more often than not been specialists in either African or Native American art. And as such, the Pacific Collection has suffered from intermittent periods of neglect. And when curatorial members did take an interest in the Pacific, it was more often the arts of Polynesia, Melanesia, Micronesia, and Australia that their exhibitions focused. So we have these, these multiple axes of institutional neglect, kind of like to think of them as, as wefts and warps, that have <laughs> worked together to weave the, the Indonesian textile collection into a situation of being largely unseen and underutilized. But luckily, that is changing. So since Ramilla's email in 2016, it led to a few days of really exciting encounters and storage <laughs> and some truly surprising finds. On one exhausting but exhilarating day, Ramilla and I conducted a mini survey of the museum's Balinese textile collection with the help of conservators Lisa Bruno, Aaron Anderson, and Asian art curator Joan Cummins. So as we opened box after box and enrolling these textiles to examine weaving patterns, we couldn't help but marvel at the textile's excellent condition. Despite existing in the museum for 90 years or longer, the brilliant colors and shining metal-wrapped threads were exquisitely preserved. Inattention, it seemed, had enabled a strong collection. <laughs> um, so undisturbed by decades, these textiles are today in excellent condition and ripe for further examination. So um, the heightened interest in the ex Indonesian textile collection has led to some exciting projects which are increasing its visibility. Um, oh yeah, here's, here's one more. <laughs> um, today, Indonesian textiles from Sumatra and Timor are on view in the Cross Collection exhibition, Infinite Blue, and our conservation team is helping us to identify the composition of their dyes. Two textiles linked to this exhibition are likely on view for the first time since 1930. Also, since Ramilla's visit, the textile collection has played host to a class of Bard Graduate Center students as a supplement to their coursework on Balinese weaving. Our morning and storage prov provided the students with a means to put their studies of weaving techniques into perspective and enabled robust discussions in the presence of some truly spectacular textiles. Related research projects have also led to some exciting finds. Ermilla discovered this photograph uh, of a textile on view in Amsterdam in 1915, which you can see in her book. And the textile was one of Van Kirkhoff's and is currently in the Brooklyn Museum's collection. To 
to my knowledge, it has not been exhibited since it came into the museum, possibly not since 1915. And finally, with the help of our archivist, Jennifer Neal, I recently discovered what appears to be a catalog of the Van Kirchhoff collection. It is entirely in Dutch, but I hope to have it and also the rest of Adam's correspondence translated sometime in the future. So digging into the history of this one Salendong has opened up avenues of scholarship and institutional collaboration that have animated not only the museum's history, but the textile collection itself. From just another undocumented item in a vast encyclopedic museum, engaging seriously with this textile has propelled it into new spheres of interaction and new means of interpretation. We now have color photography. <laughs> um, its inclusion in a 21st century exhibition is not only welcome, but long overdue. So, obviously, the voices that are missing in this presentation are those of the artists and communities who created, wore, and eventually parted from these textiles. And my examination of the textiles' histories is necessarily limited by the reports of the American and European men who collected and ex exhibited them. So, one of the biggest questions, I think, for museum practitioners today is how to explore the agency of collections when their creators were often denied continuing agency by the very nature of the collecting relationship. Without provenance, we can only guess at the lives that these textiles led prior to their um, engagement with museum anthropological projects. Uh, this dilemma is not new, and neither is the study of collection history as a means to remedy some of these complications, because the ability to meaningfully interpret collections relies on understanding their social lives, the way in which they were created, collected, exhibited, and cared for, and the embedded intentions behind each stage in that journey. So also, the textile collection at the Brooklyn Museum is far from unique, even amongst American museums. Its presence is a direct and indirect product of colonialism. Its histories of exhibition have been entangled with Orientalist projects obsessed with capturing and translating the exotic. And it has often been used and packaged as artistic fodder available for the inspiration of others. Exhibitions like Armilla's Fabricating Power, which situate the conversation in terms of beliefs and life rituals, are obvious ways to renegotiate the authority of museum displays and envision new means of agency, not only of collections, but of their communities and creators. So clearly there is more to be done at Brooklyn <coughs> to engage deeply in the social resonance and lives of these textiles. But I am struck by the staying power of both Kulin and Adam's curatorial frameworks on contemporary curatorial projects. <coughs> I find welcome resonance in Kulin's desire to create spaces for collections to continually blossom, and in Adam's desire to use museum collections to foster deeper connections between people. I think these textiles have indeed blossomed again. Their ability to inspire and draw people into their stories, while it never truly left them, um, I think the, the ways in which we use our institutional power to support or suppress that agency is an important thing to consider. I also think the legacies of Kulin, Adam, and those that came after, I, I'm, I'm wondering kind of how to bring those forward into the 20th century, 21st century, mm -hmm. that which is still relevant in their ideas, but in ways that uh, combat the legacies of Orientalism and colonialism in which they were originally embedded. Certainly one way is to continue searching for the stories of each individual textile, for there is immense power in being able to tell one story. So today, the Brooklyn Museum's mission is to create inspiring encounters with art that expand the way we see ourselves, the world, and its possibilities, where great art and courageous conversations are catalysts for a more connected, civic, and empathetic world. Myself, I always strive to value processes over products, relationships over information, and people over things. And I hope that by continuing to make visible these textiles and their histories, we all can approach a more engaged and meaningful curatorial. so much for that, that uh, extremely informative and I think, and I mean this in the best sense, impassioned uh, vision of what curatorial scholarship can be. We have time for a few questions before a break. Do I see hands raised? Yes. Uh, at, in Worcester, where I live, Worcester, Massachusetts, at the Worcester Art Museum, there's a very similar disappeared collection of Jap absolutely spectacular Japanese batik. And the um, Asian art curator, Vivian Lee, and I recently examined it. And um, she's under the impression that since it was collected in the 1920s until now, until this year, 
It's never been opened again. It's just absolutely disappeared. It was under wraps for all these years. Um, is that what happened with that spectacular index, which I think is the best piece in, in uh, Armilla's show? Was it never opened, never looked at in low these many decades? Um, in terms of exhibition, I think probably, no, I don't think it's been exhibited. I, I don't know whether it was exhibited in Adam's 1930 show. I'm not I, talking about exhibition, just, just somebody since. looking at it. Just um, our conservators did a rehousing of textiles in, mm -hmm. let's say, 2000 or so. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that was when it was re-rolled in box. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, it's probably that was probably the first time that the box had been opened since mm -hmm. 1945. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's most of these textiles, I mean, the, the images that I showed you are of the Bolognese material, only because Vermilla wanted to see the Bolognese material, and I was mm -hmm. rapidly snapping uh, as much photography as I could. But the, I mean, there's, uh, there's 112 textiles from Van Kirchhoff from the Brooklyn Museum. Most of them are photographed, so there's, there's surely a lot more research and work to be done, and mm -hmm. hopefully some more exciting things mm -hmm. to find. You mentioned yes. the catalog in yes. Dutch. Um, what does it contain? Do you, is it just a and the numbers and the numbers the different textiles or and when where they came from so what they a, were bought for or something like that there's a combination there is an inventory sheet of each number of, of each of um, Van Kirchhoff's numbers and the later Purple Museum numbers that say what they are and where they were acquired and then there's a booklet that is it looks more like a kind of a collection essay um, and featured in it are some of the the more uh, exhibited textiles of Kirchhoff's, including this one. Um, so I don't know what that booklet contains. I hope there is a, a collection history there. Um, but again, it needs to be translated, um, or somebody who speaks yeah. Dutch needs yeah. to be able to let us know. So mm -hmm. again, an avenue for future research. I would love to come and see it. Do you know of the couple? I read Dutch. I'll come and look at I'm sure I'm not the only Dutch speaker in the room. Uh, yes, at the back. Uh, your, your paper addresses the big issue of um, scholarly access to collections. Um, what kind of process is Brooklyn Museum doing at this stage in terms of uh, placing the collection online and um, especially with these kinds of unphotographed parts? Sure, so we, we have an online collection that we are constantly working to make it a little more robust and helpful to the scholars. Um, that, all the images that I was able to take with Amilla are now on our website. Um, also, our archives have finding aids that are available on our website, but if there are scholars who are interested in looking uh, more closely into the histories of these textiles, one of the best ways is to get in touch uh, with our curatorial departments because the, the amount of information that gets populated from the database into our online collections is sometimes spotty. So it's certainly available, and we're trying to make it more accessible for scholars. Um, <coughs> but, but yes, there are, I would recommend if anyone wants to, reaching out to the curatorial departments uh, directly. Further questions? Yes. Uh, thank you. I was interested in your comments about communities and the textiles. And I'm wondering if you know of museums in Indonesia that might be working in unique or particularly uh, effective ways with communities <coughs> to display and present these sorts of materials? I would defer to, to my colleagues here. As, as I mentioned, this is not really my area of expertise. Um, I'm sure there, I hope that there are. Um. Uh, the, in Singapore, not in Indonesia, but the Asian Civilizations Museum has kind of an assertive approach to making their collection accessible and yes. a study collection. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the Textile Museum in Jakarta, Jakarta. tries hard, mm -hmm. actually. They are overly ambitious, I think, in their uh, programs, mm -hmm. but they certainly try very hard. The uh, National Museum uh, in uh, Jakarta uh, is not very uh, proactive, unfortunately. Most curators there are in half-time positions and are just uh, don't have the ability and the facilities. Yes? I'm just to add, the Textile Museum in Kuala Lumpur, I mean, covering some of the same ethnicities, and also the Textile Museum in Sarawak in um, Kuching. Yeah. And then there's a lot of Kuching textile artists that have relationships with that museum. Well, yes. yes. 
Thank you so much. This was really wonderful. I'm, I'm inspired yeah. to go to the yeah. Museum yeah. and work with these connections. Um, the two quotes that you bring here um, suggests the earlier question about Deleuze and Guattari and ideas about rhizomatic kinds of theories and ways of thinking about the relationship between textiles and the plants that are part of the dying process but also are used medicinally. So the healing of wounds and the preserving of seeds of things. And I think that we are changing the ways that we think about textiles and the way we write about them. They're much more interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. So your talk has generated a wonderful way of bringing that on board. And I think what Adrian said earlier about um, Deleuze and Guattari's influence really came from, in large part from Bateson, but also if you look in the footnotes, Colin McPhee is there as well. Mm -hmm. And the rhizome, the golden mm -hmm. germ, which comes right out of FDK Bosch's work mm -hmm. on South Asian materials. Mm -hmm. So I think that this idea of uh, theorizing and applying theories is one I think that we need mm -hmm. to rethink too. So thank you so much. This was really exciting. Thank you. So I think at this point we, we will take a break. I just wanted to make one remark about this though, that something that I think Megan's uh, presentation raises and that your, your intervention does as well, which is the place of scholarship in museums and the place of curatorial and conservation scholarship in museums. I think underlying Megan's presentation is, uh, is she brings without making any, uh, any claims of self, uh, of difficulty within which she works, but she brings to our attention how much museum scholars are under pressure mm -hmm. in terms of being able to work with their collections, with the people whom their collections relate to. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I just want to put in a plea for those of you who are museum trustees, <laughs> and there may well be some in the room, please remember that curatorial and conservation scholarship is at the heart of what any museum does. Yeah. <laughs> and now I ask you to repeat that applause, but for Megan. <laughs>